So let's, <clears throat> start, let's turn to John chapter 11, 25 and 26, and then John chapter 20, our text. If you want to stand with me, a little stretching moment here. John chapter 11, John's gospel is featured today in the message. John's gospel is just so glorious, so wonderful for us all. In John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And later on, this call to believe, Jesus wanting to encourage faith in trials, in difficulties, faith for our salvation. This is about uh, Thomas, oftentimes called Doubting Thomas. Now Thomas, called Didymus, or the twin, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the resurrected Lord. We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked. The doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Be at peace, rest, chill, for goodness sake. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Firm faith, unshakable faith. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Lord, we immediately enter into the blessing right now that you pronounced in that day. Blessed are those who have not seen but have believed. Lord, we walk into this blessing, Lord. We just eat of it. We drink of it. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, you are the one who is the beatitude. You are the blessing. When we know you, we are blessed, Lord. So we're walking in that blessing. We're receiving strength and courage, even now, in the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen. amen. You may be seated and relax. And as Jesus said, peace, shalom. We've all heard the expression, doubting Thomas, I hope. Have you grown up with the expression, doubting Thomas? Or uh, accused anyone of being a doubting Thomas? Or looked in the mirror and said, you are a doubting Thomas? Um, sometimes a little honesty is good, uh, provided that we don't stay there in that place, especially if it's a, not a good place. But I believe this passage would better serve us if we called Thomas transitioning from doubt into unshakable faith. Or how about the transformation of doubting Thomas into believing Thomas? How many of you know that you are under construction one of Matt's, uh, I loved Matt's songs last night. He had such a, an array of songs. And one of them was uh, basically titled Under Construction. And it was a cleverly lyric, lyrical song of God's not finished with any of us yet. And he's still working. And be careful when you come into my realm because I am under construction. And it's a little messy around here. How many of you have ever been to a workshop of uh, a woodsman or a silversmith or a blacksmith. It's, it's a little bit messy at times. How many of you have ever been into my office? Or there are times when I come to pick up Dory and I can tell immediately when I walk in the office if there's going to be a long wait or not. 
because all I have to do is look at the office. And if her desk has mountains of things on it, I say, okay, what do we got here? Maybe 45 minutes, half hour? And Joyce says, five minutes, no problem. <laughs> That's usually what happens. But you can tell, under construction, it's not always a pretty sight, but there's work being done, and we're all making that transition, and then suddenly there was light. But it, it's a beautiful story. It's heartwarming, and it's there for you and I. Um, Merrill Tenney, a wonderful uh, Bible expositor, says concerning Thomas, he says, Thomas appears as a loyal, outspoken, rather pessimistic person who was uncertain of the future but closely attached to Jesus. And I just love that. That, that. That's almost everybody I know. <laughs> You know, and I look in the mirror and I say, that's you, you know, and that's why my heart was warm. Let me read it again. Thomas appears as a loyal, outspoken, rather pessimistic person who was uncertain of the future, but really holding on to Jesus, closely attached to Jesus. That reminds me of so many Christians, some of you, and you look at me and say, it reminds me of you too. <laughs> right, Dory? But we all need to take this journey from being a doubter into unshakable faith. Because as Matt was saying last night, God loves us just the way we are. How many of you know that? But he loves us too much to leave us that way. He's not finished with you. If you think you're too old to be ch changing, you got problems. I'm 65, and God is nowhere near finished with me yet. <laughs> I'm doing a detox diet right now. That For me, that means every single day I have to eat a green salad. And almost every day I'm doing fresh vegetable juicing. The problem with this detox diet is don't... Okay, I won't go into too much any details. I hear you. The problem with it is I wake up feeling sick every single morning. And I said, Dory, are you having morning sickness lately? Are, are we pregnant or, or something? And then all of a sudden, it dawns on me, you're doing a detox diet. Remember, that's why you feel this way every single morning. And, and you know, when you're going through whatever cleansing you want to be cleansed of, whether it's spiritual, physical, whatever it might be, there's going to be some negative side effects. If you read it all about detox, detoxing your body and detoxing, and detoxing diets, it's not a pretty thing. But God wants to detox you and I from unhealthy things that we have attached ourselves to. When we go through trials or tribulations or we see a bad day coming, we cling to earthly things instead of saying, you are my all in all. You are the one that I am holding on to through this trial. I rid myself of all other addictions and hold on to the holy dependency upon Jesus. John, the writer of John's gospel, of course, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, his writings are wonderful. John says in 1 John 5, 4, everyone who is born of God will overcome the world. Does John know what he's talking about? Everyone who has the new birth will overcome the world. This is the victory that ultimately overcomes the world, our faith. May the faith that we have in Jesus and his resurrection presence empower us when we go through trials and difficulties. Empower us to share our faith. Empower us to share our faith when we're used to running past our neighbors and, and running to the next thing to take a moment and just bless them. To, when you go into the, your house at night and you look out and it's dark, uh, darkness everywhere, you know it's a picture of the spiritual darkness, pray a prayer of blessing for your neighbors. Call them by name, whisper by name, and say, Lord, I bless um, my neighbors across the street. Uh, Lord, I bless my neighbors on my right. I bless my neighbors on my left. And then watch 
the Lord at work. There's this dear man who had multiple sclerosis in our neighborhood. He used to walk up and down the street with his machinery on, his multiple sclerosis, because he couldn't do it any other way. And he was determined to be set free. Now he walks up and down the neighborhoods and he's completely free from his machinery. And every time I see him, pardon me, the canes, the multiple canes, I call it machinery. And now he's completely free of it, and I still see him walking up and down the streets. He was committed to walking his way back to health, and he's defying what the doctors said. He's a wonderful man. Every now and then he'll stop and talk. He's younger than I am. Just, uh, we saw him the other day. I saw him wa- uh, marching down the street, and I waved to him. You know, we've had a few conversations. Just a wonderful uh, human individual, just a wonderful person. But brothers and sisters, God wants to help us. I love the book of Revelation. Look at Revelation 2, 12 through 13. These resurrected appearances of Jesus. In the book of Revelation, of course, Jesus is there. He says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Um, Revelation 1, this was on the bulletin, of course. Uh, have you noticed how excellent Cora's bulletins are lately? She's taken over the printing of them, so they uh, l- leaped forward in bounds of excellency compared to when I was printing them. But in uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, when I saw Jesus, I fell at his feet as though I were dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Some would think or say that Satan held those keys for a moment in time. But in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, he comes into the pit of hell and he takes those keys right from the enemy. And he says, I've got the keys and I will never relinquish them again. Jesus has the keys. Never forget a message I heard on that one day. Just smoked my soul. Fire from heaven's throne. But look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, right, uh, uh, one of the Asian cities, much persecution, much persecution Christians endured. These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. That's Jesus. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. There are certain cities on planet Earth where Satan has a throne. Some people believe Salem is a throned city where Satan has a power stronghold. There are cities around the world that are so dark and so deadly and so evil that Satan has a throne there, a throne of darkness. It's very hard to be a Christian or to share your testimony in those kinds of areas. But he says, I know where you live, where Satan, the accuser, Satan means someone who accuses, just keeps on, keeps on accusing where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. That's you guys. You guys have an unshakable faith. You have remained true to the name of Jesus. You've fallen down. You've gotten back up. Small churches on the North Shore, they fall down and they rise again. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. Righteous man, righteous woman, you get up. You make a mistake. I love the song, All My Fears and Failures. Now I surrender, mighty to save. And Jesus says, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness. Antipas means everything against you. Everything came against you. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, underlining where Satan lives and it has been unleashed. In the days of the Salem witch trials, one of the ministers says, said in his writings, the devil has been loosed in Salem. I mean, how would you like to be a minister who says that? The devil has been loosed in Salem. What about the resurrection power? But there is this clashing of two realms, of two worlds, and we have to be so strong. If it is true that there is a throne of darkness in Salem that is beyond cosmetic, that there is a genuine occult there, we have to continually be on our guard and be strong in the Lord and in his power. 
But Thomas, the disciple, is an example for us. Look at what uh, the Gospel of John records about him. Just go back to John eleven sixteen, the resurrection chapter. We read, I am the resurrection and the life. The context of that, of course, is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. But look at Thomas with me a, a little bit here. Thomas is an example for us. Um, 11, 16, um, Jesus says, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. That is, he's going to raise him from the dead. And he knew that that was going to bring much encouragement to them. Says, I, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Then Thomas, very much misinterpreting the situation, trying hard, Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may all die with him. That is uh, a very dark statement. It is a pessimistic statement. It doesn't have any life in it. The language reveals the darker side of Thomas's faith. Let's not expect too much from God here. Let's not inconvenience the Lord. Let's just keep everything safe. And that's where Thomas was. As Charles Spurgeon said, most Christians live their lives as if Jesus is not risen from the dead. They believe he died for them, but they don't necessarily believe that he is alive for them in the midst of whatever they might be going through. But also look at, at John chapter 14. I, I love Thomas's statements because they bring forth these great responses. Again, he's an example for us. And if we're honest with ourselves, we don't point the finger at somebody else and say, oh, you of little faith. No, we look at ourselves and say, Lord, give me more faith. Give me more resurrection faith. Give me more strength so that I'm not blown away by the next wind that comes along. But look at... Uh, John, uh, John chapter 14, you, you know this context so well. Thomas is confused about the words that Jesus are speaking. And uh, Jesus says to him in verse 4 of uh, John 14, you know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we really don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? A double, double question. Lord, we, we don't know. We're kind of confused about what's going on. All this talk of death, and we know the Romans are coming, and all these difficult things, but what does Jesus say? One of these titanic verses of Scripture, Jesus answers one of the magnificent sayings in the Bible. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to Abba, the Father, except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus is saying that, Thomas, the way forward, dude, here is relationship with me. The way forward is sticking close to me. Jesus could not give him a perfect road map for what was about to happen, but he was going to have to have an unshakable faith in the Lord. So th there's a beautiful, beautiful reality here of uh, his growing in the Lord. L look at John 20, 25, zeroing in on the passage. Here's Thomas in his stubborn, relentless faith. I believe he loved Jesus and believed in him, but he just didn't believe he was resurrected. He says to the disciples who are excited that Jesus is risen, he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where his nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Testing our faith, seeing what's really there. And then he doesn't, he does bring some mild rebukes once in a while. Jesus says here, stop doubting and believe. That is, stop this wavering back and forth. Do you believe one day and you don't believe the next day? One day you're hitting the pits and you're driving down the road into oblivion and depression and despair and suicidal thoughts. The next day you're on the mountain again. You're bipolar, up and down, up and down. 
And I, I read a short book the other day, a little article saying we are the bipolar generation. One day we're up, next day we're down. We're sky high and we're in the pits, addicted again. But that's part of how we can relate to one another. We can help one another. Instead of condemning one another, encourage one another. Let's remember Thomas. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 13. Guess who was there in Acts chapter 1, verse 13, waiting for the Holy Spirit to fall? Was it doubting Thomas? Or was it faith-filled an expectant Thomas. I would have loved to have heard the conversations that day amongst the disciples as they waited for the Spirit to be poured out. But look at what it says in uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 13. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas. Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the political zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Not Judas who betrayed Jesus, but Judas, the son of James. But there he was in his stubborn faith. Now this stubbornness turns around to be a stubbornness for the glory of God because Thomas becomes a great missionary who ends up laying his life down. He was martyred for the glory of the Lord. Stubborn, believing, trusting God, never giving up. Well, brothers and sisters, this is the battle for the mind. This is the battle for the heart. Did you know that the gateway to your heart is your mind? I can get you to do all kinds of silly things if I can convince you of something in your mind because then it will possess your soul. Joyce Meyer, I love, how many of you like Joyce Meyer? I appreciate her teach. She has a book called The Battlefield of the Mind, right? The, the Battlefield of the Mind, that's where it all exists in order to get a hold of your affections, in order to get a hold of your true identity. The doorway to possess the heart is the mind, and there is a battle going on there. Second Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 you, you know it well. If our gospel is hidden or veiled to a lot of people, it's veiled to those who are perishing. For the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. That speaks of a bondage of the heart and the soul. Martin Luther, in the unbelievably violent years of uh, the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, wrote a book called The Bondage of the Will. It was his magnum opus, his most important work. And in it, he spoke of the total inability and the total depravity of the human will to set itself free from unbelief and despair unless there was divine intervention. No divine intervention no freedom. But when there is divine intervention, the power of the gospel, you can be set free. It's a simple, simple thesis. The total inability and total depravity of the human will to set itself free from unbelief and despair unless there is a divine revelation, the bondage of the will. Um, 2 Corinthians 11.3, just look at that real, real quick with me. 2 Corinthians 11.3. We always come back to these bread and butter scriptures. Paul says to the Corinthian believers, I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds, the battlefield of the mind, your mind may somehow be led astray from what? Your sincere and pure devotion to Jesus. Satan's goal, according to this passage, is to dislodge you from your dependency upon Jesus, from holding on to him. <clears throat> and it replays the scenario in the Garden of Eden. Satan comes with an argument. He says, well, if you eat of the fruit of this tree, then you will become like him. 
And he comes with a type of an argument. But uh, Paul gives us the way out. He shows us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, the weapons we fight with, here's true spiritual warfare, if you will, the weapons we fight with, that is Christians who are battling in the spirit, we fight with are not the weapons of the world, guns, tanks, bombs, nuclear weapons, but on the contrary, our weapons have divine power to demolish, destroy Satan's strongholds. And we learn to demolish. This is a powerful military word. We demolish arguments. Uh, pick up the word there. It's the word for logos. Logos, where you get the word logic from. Satan always comes. He's always logical. To the homosexual, he comes and says, all oh, those Christians and all that biblical stuff. Are you kidding me? That's old-fashioned religion. Your true ticket to joy and freedom is to get out of that religious bondage. Are you kidding me? That Bible is just old. It's, it should be on the shelf collecting dust. Are you kidding me? It's filled with pre prejudice, Sodom and Gomorrah. Are you kidding me? And Satan comes with a sophisticated argument to set you free into the new freedom but it's just the old bondage of the will in a new format with a little glitz and a little glitter and a Hollywood movie star to top it off. It's the same old argument, but the Bible says we learn to demolish arguments. And again, it's the word logos, logic. We demolish these arguments and every pretension the word for pretension there is a sophisticated pretending, deceitfulness, deception. Somebody walks into the room, and he ha how many of you have ever seen a, a movie where they wear these clever disguises, and you think it's totally somebody else, completely somebody else, and then they take off the mask, and it's not who you thought it was. A total disguise. Uh, sophisticated pretending. But these things set themselves up against the knowledge of who God is. And we learn to take every thought and make it obedient to Christ. That is, we arrest these thoughts and say, that doesn't square with who God is. God is compassionate. God is loving. God is patient. And all these things lift themselves up against the knowledge of who the Lord is. That's why the Gospel of John is so important in the beginning was the logos, the logic of God against Satan is Jesus Christ coming to die on the cross for us. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word for word there is logos. Whenever the enemy comes up against you, remember the old Dracula movies? Remember when Dracula would slither out of his coffin? What was the old-fashioned way, according to those movies, of putting him back in his coffin, holding up the power of the cross, holding up the power of Jesus? And Dr the Dracula death spirit would have to slither back into his coffin. There are times I just, just love what There are times on Saturday nights, I'm, I'm here by myself, and I just walk Around. I say, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we are taking our stand against the devil's schemes. In the name of Jesus, we will not relent. In the name of Jesus, we come up against the death and the darkness. In the name of Jesus, we take our stand against the devil's schemes. For God is a refuge, God is a strength, God is an ever-present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we shall not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. The power of our victory is the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. The power of our victory is the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. We are assured of the victory, brothers and sisters. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. God will prove faithful. 
God will be with us. In the beginning was the logos, the logic of God coming up against Satan. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And if your loved one is battling homosexuality, get down in that pit with them and love them. Get down with that pit in that pit with them and weep with them and cry for them and say, I'm going to believe and love with you. The unshakable revelation. I love the story of Lee Strobel and Josh McDowell as we look at the, the text here. Jesus invites investigation. Isn't that cool? Jesus isn't intimidated. Come, check, check out the wounds. He says, peace be to you. It's Jesus, there's a lot of peace. In me you will have peace. In this world you will have tribulation. Be strong and have great courage. For I have overcome the world. Do you sense any anxiety in Jesus? There's no anxiety conditions in heaven. Anxiety conditions on planet Earth are running totally rampant. Anxiety medications sell like crazy. Jesus says, peace, shalom, peace be with you. If you need anxiety medication, take it. But have a short-term view of how long you have to take it. Don't make it a lifelong thing. Jesus says, my peace, my peace, I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. And he invites investigation. Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. But stop doubting and believe. Become unshakable. Lee Strobel in our generation, the movie was showing. I wish I had gotten to see it over at Liberty Tree Mall. A Case for Christ, the true story. Just like Josh McDowell, a generation before, these two men both had stubborn wives who were Bible-believing Christians filled with the Spirit. And their husbands, both of them, Lee Strobel and Josh McDowell, they were out to disprove and humiliate their wives and disprove the resurrection. And in their investigation discovered of the, re the reality of the resurrection, Lee Strobel writes a book called The Case for Christ. His story. Josh McDowell. How many of you remember Josh McDowell? Evidence that demands a verdict. An unbeliever becomes a believer through the trial of his life. But look at this subtle rebuke. There are times when Jesus will come and say to me, hey, how long have I been walking with you? Stop doubting and believe. Learn how to be at peace. Why are you so stressed? <laughs> Just be relaxed here. Enjoy yourself a little bit more. There are great scriptures on this mountain peak revelation. You know, when we receive that revelation to trust the Lord, it means health to our body. Oh. Look at, it was one of my favorite mountain peak verses, Isaiah 7, the middle of verse 9. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand firm at all. The Mount Everest verse of Scripture there, uh, Isaiah 7, 9. Also Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. I go back and I listen to my sermons once in a while Keith and Dory were labored together to put the sermons up online. So I, I listened to my whole sermon this week. Saw the, the artwork of Mitch Brady and Larissa Doyle from Ireland. And uh, it was just really cool. I listened to the whole message and think, thank you, Jesus. Praise your name. But look at uh, uh, Isaiah 26.3. You will keep in shalom, shalom, a double emphatic you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is stayed upon thee, the King James says. The NIV says, him whose mind is steadfast. Remember, it's the battle for the mind. I will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he's learned to trust in you. And then underline, trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord, double emphatic, use of Yahweh is the rock eternal. We are easily shaken. We are also fragile. 
But God is the rock eternal, immovable, unshakable. And when we attach ourselves to him, we begin to get a little bit like him. Perhaps the strongest affirmation of faith in the Holy Scriptures, ironically, comes from the person we call Doubting Thomas. Perhaps the strongest affirmation of faith comes by the one that we call Doubting Thomas. My Lord and my God. He's declaring the lordship of Jesus in that blazing revelation from the throne of God. Jesus Christ is Lord over all of the earth. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is Lord. In these moments, suddenly Thomas gets it. A blazing fire of lightning revelation comes into his soul and he beholds Jesus and says, my Lord and my God. For a Jew to call Jesus God is utter blasphemy if it isn't true. But Jesus is, as the great creed, the Apostles' Creed says, Jesus is God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father through whom all things were made. He is Son of God. Therefore, Thomas can rightfully say, my Lord, my God. And then Jesus affirms this proclamation. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Believed what? That Jesus is the Lord. And he is Son of God. He is God himself, God from God. God gives birth to God. He is Jesus. What incredible revelation. Beautiful passage. And then you walk into the blessing. Because you have seen me, you have believed, Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen me, but yet have believed. Seals a blessing for generations to come. A blessing for generations to come. Well, God is obviously after joyful surrender to Jesus daily. When we go through fiery trials, and we do, Amy Cortese, the uh, Spanish woman who was the first uh, officer of the uh, Department of Corrections in New York, when she spoke at North Central Bible College, she said to a, a, a room filled with North Central Bible College students, and she said, never minimize people's problems but always magnify the Lord. Never minimize people's problems, but always magnify the Lord. That's what we have to do. We learn how to walk in the blessing. The blessing of the Lord is greater than the curse. God wants, number one, joyful surrender to Jesus daily will bring healing to our souls. He wants us to receive the blessing of believing. Stop doubting and believing, stop wavering, and also share the blessing with a loved one, someone who lives in your own same house or in your family, make a phone call. Number four, share the blessing with a stranger, someone that you've never shared the gospel with. But let's pray right now. God wants to give us unwavering, unshakable faith, and when we fall, we get back up again, and our faith overcomes Lord, we bless one another right now. We give you the credit. We give you the glory. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. All we have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is yet to come. In the name of Jesus. Thank you.